again, everyone. Another message that's coming in from Facebook. I think today I'm going to share. The idea doesn't exhaust me today, and I'm listening to all your fresh stuff. No necessity to reply unless you want. I'm going to tell a portion from the beginning. <clears throat> I was the third child of a woman, Nancy, and her husband, Gary. I don't remember their marriage. I don't remember anything about him. He divorced my mother and ran like the wind from her. She chased, according to my bio dad's sister, yet the divorce proceeded. Hence, life went on for the damn self with three daughters, despite the mother having a horrible time with the sick baby, me, and how she had been abandoned with such a harrowing situation. So, so sick I was. I remember endless aspirins propped into my mouth and rectal thermometers being stuffed in my ass. I remember looking out the window in an upstairs bedroom watching children play, saddened. I was too sick to go play with the thriving children. I remember being so hungry inside that room that I ate my fingernails and cuticles and eventually would suck my thumb, wishing I could he eat if it only if only it didn't hurt. I was so sick. Rheumatic fever had taken a toll and I had become and I had become with rheumatoid arthritis. When I told I might be when I was when told I might be crippled, I remembered the movie Heidi, the mountain girl who became crippled also. And it's a story of triumph as she walks into her grandfather's arms. He loved her very much and I wondered if it would be so would be so special, so loved. So much tender care and love her grandfather did give, and so I thought it wouldn't be so bad. Maybe I would be too. I was approximately three. And we do fantasize a lot when we're going through this as children of somebody coming in and saving us and the life that we that we want. So that that fantasy is uh something i understand around the same time nancy took her smallest daughter into a cafe all small and frail i was and despite that i climbed up onto a fella's lap and he was delighted nice little girl you have there and soon after they were dating engaged and married married by then my thumbs were raw from sucking and my fingers chewed raw I was approximately four. I'm going to get this girl healthy, he vowed, and he did. He bandaged my fingers, appointed me as a sidekick, and would beam proudly at me at the meal table. See, see, Nancy, she has a great appetite. Yep, we're going to get her healthy as a horse. I would think that the reason why you were getting pains is you were getting some kind of Pavlovian pain to it. Probably because when you ate, your mother reacted negatively. So it was almost a fear of your mother from eating. That's where the nervous, that's where the nail, because I was a horrible nail biter, side of my finger biter, bit my cuticles till they bled, picked at things. Those are ner that's a nervous condition. That's not, that, that's up here. That's a mental thing. Okay, that's out of your nerves being shot to hell as a little child and not knowing how to handle it. I don't think you had an eating problem. I think you had a Pavlovian problem that you would get a negative response out of your mother if you ate healthily and it didn't cause pain. Your mother wanted the pain. She enjoyed it, you know, because it brought attention and pity on, onto herself. Nancy would mumble, Nancy would mumble her contempt, not palpable being I was so young. Also, while it was palpable, in that it was it was affecting you negatively that you were getting pained when you ate. You just didn't understand that. You just didn't understand why. Also at this time, my sister, three years older, was molesting me. Full-blown shame assault and sophisticated blackmail campaigns for a perpetrator so young. Well, if your sister was molesting you at that age, you were three or four, that would make you, and your sister's three years old, that'd make her six or seven. So I would I would question, and not that I'm excusing your sister with whatever she may be doing now, because I am reading this cold as well. Um, she was six or seven, so I would question what was going on with her that was making her act like that at such a young age. 
And like most molested children, I was now wetting the bed every night. Oh, was a joy. I purely jest. Now the soiled sheets on the clothesline were a prop of humiliation. Whomever, may, whoever, whomever should pass would get to hear how these were my pissed on sheets. I deserved it. I was disgusting, I thought. I was five. What a horrible thing to do. What a horrible, horrible thing to do. Wow. And I, I, I would venture to guess your mother deliberately left, let those sheets get stained just so she could put them out there for you to be humiliated. Because human urine is not animal urine. It typically doesn't stain like animal urine does. And if you wet your bed and you wake up right away, your mother should have been throwing them right in the washing machine and that should come right out. Confused by my sickness and confused about why I couldn't stop wetting the bed, I summed up my value early as the one she wished she didn't have so much work, the sick child, so, so much. So much, so much so that for some reason, at the same time, I was tested for early entrance into school. For such a sickly child, I had, I had behavior problems, hyperactivity. Nonetheless, I didn't start kindergarten until fall of 1972, which would tell me your mother was looking to, to push you out during the day and then deal with, you know, your sickness at night for her sympathy. But now I felt worldly, much stronger. I had put on weight and worked alongside my new dad, helping him with anything a boy could do and better. The abuse by my sister at this point was very sporadic, although it did seem to correlate with when I'd get attention from my new daddy. At this, the last time it happened, a couple things happened subsequently. Makes me remember it. You know, we really have absolutely zero insight in the moment as an eight year, as eight year olds. It's a Christmas vacation. We were, putting, we were put to bed early because kids are bad. We heard someone come into the house downstairs, a familiar voice, a friend of our mother, Emily, had come over. My mother's nicest friend, the friend that treated me protectively, albeit subtly so. She had her son Todd with. He followed her over on his boxy blue jet snowmobile. And both Emily and Todd appealed, appealed, appealed to Nancy to let the girls from their beds. By now, there were, there were five of us. Us three oldest clumbered down the stairs, hardly believing our lucky stars while the babies slept in their beds. It was only eight or nine o'clock. I was the first dressed and, on, and the first to go with Todd, with Todd on the snowmobile. I remember doing wife wide figure eights in the park next to the house and taking fast air over the railroad tracks. The snow was incredibly deep. The hedge line was barely visible as it rimmed the park. And that too was now more so a hill than a snowdrift. We jumped that thing over and over losing track of time until we suddenly hit hard into something concealed beneath the snow. And we both realized that we had hit a huge grill the size of a pool table masoned in, but where, but where the water, but where the water fountain was, forgetting it was there, we bent the hell out of the grill bars, a big pressed V where the blue jet landed, and then there was a rattling where the track spins. We stopped out on the road outside the house. My dad comes out to help Todd, and the track was broke. They load the snowcat up, and Todd goes home. Later, while I'm in bed, my sister molests me. As she retreats, as she retreats her assault, she says, maybe you won't think you're so cute around Todd next time. Wow, what a little snot. I'm in second grade and a couple months pass. And while playing Barbies, my sister has Barbie and Ken sexualizing. And of course, I'm sexual in that lies now also. And when the topic of Ken's dick, I said, it doesn't look like that. How do you know, she says, and of course I assume naively, like any small child would, that after being threatened, blackmailed, shamed into, into keeping secrets, 
I assumed this too was a secret we had kept. And I told her, I saw Scott Larson in the first grade bathroom. We agreed to meet on the arrangement we'd show each other. And I swear I didn't, I didn't show. He went first and I pulled the old ditch and bail. Anyways, I told her and later I'm called into the kitchen. Now my mother knows all about it and now my worthlessness is amplified. My sister has made good at making me the dirty and naughty one. Later I cried and cowered before my hero daddy and had to tell him I saw a penis. That I made an agreement to meet a boy in the bathroom and never saw one. Nancy had a look on her face no different than my sister when strangleholding me into being a sacrificial lamb. But I did feel filthy telling him. He seemed embarrassed. My mother disappointed because I hadn't been denounced by him at that very moment. There was a fight and she is telling him that if he wants to stick up for me, she'll take the rest of the kids and leave. She screams through the house, all my sisters know I'll be the reason. Even the babies who don't know anything yet will grow up to see me as the destructive element, the dysfunction to their dysfunction. If they will lose their daddy, I will be to blame. Holy me. And, you know, this is something my, my, my wife dealt with because she was abused horribly. And she actually used her, her Barbies and she would draw girls and stuff. And she was made to feel like she was horrible and she was called disgusting and awful. And all these, all these terrible things. And she had nobody standing up for her. And, wow, is your mother really a piece of garbage? really a piece of garbage to do that to a child because kids do things i mean it's they're, they're curious i mean it's how you deal with it you know at, you know after the fact and your sister what a little <laughs> but i have no doubt something's going on was going on with your sister sexually by someone so it's probably your mother now i was a child whore and the reason for possibly breaking up the family the sec a damn second grader. I decided then and there that now and any threat of blackmail, shame, ridicule, and blame didn't matter. Never again was I going to allow my sister to touch me in tattletaling the Scott Larson story. The worst came true. Now she had no leverage. Now I didn't care what she said about me. Now a second grade slut, there was no going back. No more sex abuse under the threat of telling and saying, I started it. I liked it. I'm dirty. Already that child bitch knew I was the scapegoat and it would be believed. And so, so did I. Even though she was three and a half years older than me, she had been doing it since Nancy had been dating Bill, the new dad, by the way. But fuck it. What can you do? You don't even know about roles yet. You think you just, you, you just think you're a loser. Like many, like, like maybe you shouldn't be born. Hmm. When my dad, I never felt, when with my dad, I never felt that. When with the girls at all, it was persuasive. I should, I should die. I wish I wasn't born. No one loves me. And, the, and the no, and the one that does is shame for doing it too. the new dad. Incidentally, I could really, I could have really used a good mom during this time. In third grade, I was a sexual, I was sexually assaulted at a classmate's birthday party by the birthday boy and another classmate. I was on top of a bunk bed and tried to slide off between the wall and the bed to the lower bunk, like I had when, like I had when at home a hundred times, and I became trapped, pinned between the wall and the bed. I was stuck with, with my shoulder still on the top bunk and my leg dangling below when they pulled my pants and underwear down and molested me. Damn, I was a magnet for, for, for naughty. It was never an option to tell a trusted adult. There was no such thing in my world. Once, at, once home that day, after the party, I passed on watching The Planet, the Planet of the Apes. Unfucking believable, right? 
to sit in the shower floor and scream and cry silently and scrub and scrub and scrub. I never tell another human being, I said in torment. Another dirty secret. It was so, so bad of me. My dad sides with me. It will cause problems. And if my mother hears it, there will be no limits to the fears of what she will say or do with that information. So I silently endured and returned to the same single room classroom as the boys. As, the sa as time passed, I remembered, I remembered time heals all wounds and wondered if maybe I'd just die and that would relieve the passage of time. I wanted distance from the birthday event. I wanted immediate relief. Years took too long, the shame unbearable. I bet I don't live till my 21st birthday, I said. And who will notice a birthday of mine? These years were filled with spending an exorbitant amount of time at my friend Joni's and feeling content only when with, with she and her family. All more her parents and Arlen, her oldest brother, a big teddy bear of a guy, and Arden and Alan. Here in this house, I was liked, sometimes spoiled. You know, it's it's weird because my wife had the same thing. She used to sit tell me I'm not going to live past 25, you know, because she deals with suicide from her sexual abuse at the hands of her family and other people as well. You know, it was repeated. You know, it was her dad. It was her mom. Um, it was, you know, brothers trying to bust in on her in the bathroom. They drag her to a third world hellhole in Dominican Republic every winter, every summer, so her mother can flash off all this gold and jewelry in these rundown third world barrios, literally, and allow her to get friggin' molested again over and over and over again. So you get to the point where you think the only way out of this is to kill myself. In that house, I blew birthday candles out every year, and Isla kept some of Shari's favorite favorites stocked on the shelves of her tiny kitchen, cocoa puffs, and malto meal. She also made me plenty of potato salad and nutmeg donuts, sold her donuts in a family member fundraiser for $4,000, by the way. I shit you not. When I was in this house, I had glimpses of healing. And when I wasn't, I was at home where I was devastated, clawed on, treated with disdain, and wanted to die. And I understand that because I had a friend, Matt, who I was treated the same way. Like, never birthday parties, but there I felt like at home and I felt safe. And then when, you know, this, when I had to go to my actual home, oh, it's terrible. So I understand that, finding that safe spot. Now I had a reference of normal, and from this, another storm moved. The thing with the narcs is they hate their scapegoat to have any happiness. They hate for the scapegoat to have any solace. They hate for the scapegoat to have any reference of being lovingly. When a birthday cake wasn't there, Isla's was. A favorite two-tone dessert the size of a house. And at basketball games on parents, on parents' night. I was not at all sad to give my rose to my mom, Ella. Hmm. How will the narc handle this out of control situation of the scapegoat being created and realized into something with value by another family, which is exactly what happened to me. They hated me at, at his house. They hated me hanging out there. They would call me weird, accused us of being gay, you know, and eventually, and I talked about this in an older video, Narcissists Don't Fool Everyone, I talked about this family, and I talked about what they did for me, and I talked about how it got to the point where they saw through my parents, called them up and stood up to them, and that really freaked my parents out. It's not even, yes, they don't want to see you happy, but they're also afraid, what is she telling them? Is she telling them the truth? Am I going to be exposed? That's really, I think, what your mother was most afraid of. More later, I feel good as I write this. There's no denying how far we can come despite the horrible bullshit sent our way. 
I make a joke because I am really sick of being visited by these memories with such torment. The thing is, the thing with no contact is that leaves you out there with nothing but time to think. And time can make sense of an experience, but it still takes you through the pain, the outrage, and and to hell if I'm going to give someone my money for therapy. Ha ha, I'm a damn mental health practitioner. You have been appointed, by the way. My agency hired some life coaches. Okay, well, thank you for your kind words. Thank you for this story. I, I, I hope to hear more of it. But it just goes to show you how many of these stories are, are the same. How many, how many of us go through this stuff over and over and over again? And really, when you find it, when 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 this when the scapegoat finds a safe spot, the narcissist becomes paranoid because they're paranoid that they're going to be exposed. And that's really what's going on here. I mean, I hope you are no contact with everybody in your family. Uh, your sister had some major, major issues, major issues. And I would venture to think somebody was molesting her. It was probably your mother. It was probably your mother. And from the timeline, from what you, what your, if it was your stepfather doing it, she wouldn't have been the one he went after. It would have been you because you were the sick one. You were the ones with all the problems. You were the one easier to control. What I think happened is your your mother was doing some screwed up shit because you brought up the stuff with the rectal thermometers and the sick. I mean, it just all points to like that type of touchy feely type of narcissistic sexual predator of your mother. And I would venture to guess she was doing it to your to your older sister as well. And then when your stepfather stepped into the picture, she stopped because she had. She had him now, and it probably confused your sister, and she took it, though it damaged her, as, a, as a, some sort of rejection. You understand? So she might have actually viewed your mother stopping the abuse when she, um, when she married your stepfather as a rejection, and then she then projected it back on, projected it back on you. Uh, very sad. Very... Uh, very telling story, but something both me and my wife have dealt with directly. Everything you spoke about has either been dealt with by me or my wife, the stuff with the dolls and the hypersexual activity and all of it, all of it. You know, these all follow the same, the same playbook. But remember, okay, think about those of you who actually found a safe spot, a family that cared and took care of you. Okay, and what your narcissistic parents' reaction is to it. Okay, They're, that make that turns them to paranoia. That turns them. Your safe spot makes them paranoid. So try to try to keep that in mind. Uh, please let me know what you think. Thank you again for sending me your story. I hope everybody who's watching this video uh, gets a little something out of it. Um, if you enjoy this channel, uh, please consider donating to the GoFundMe link in the description box. And remember, if you want your story read and your story out there, and you make a donation, you go right to the top of the list, and I immediately make a video for you. This is Ali Matthews. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you all again very soon.